We've been in a series on the book of Ecclesiastes, and I trust you've been following along. If it's your first time here or you missed a couple of weeks, I would encourage you to go online to icbspain.com or go into the app and catch up with us, because every week builds on the week before in what we're talking about. If you remember Solomon, here we see is the wisest man who has ever lived. He's this wealthy, known, famous, influential king that goes to a point in his life where he realizes that what he's been searching throughout his life to find meaning in, in fact, is meaningless. If you see our logo for the series, it says meaningful. We know that's not how you spell meaningful. But if you see there's a separation there and behind full, it says less. And the reason we did it that way is because as Solomon will highlight things for us that are meaningless, really what he's going to be pushing us towards is what really brings meaning and a meaningful life. And so if you remember over the last several weeks, we've been looking at different areas where Solomon has said these things are meaningless. We remember that last week we looked at the areas of enjoyment and of experience we looked at possessions and luxury, wealth and sexuality. If you missed it, catch up with us online. In Ecclesiastes 1.13, he says, I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. And we know that Solomon is taking on this challenge as his personal life mission to see if he can find, if anything in this life brings lasting, true meaning apart from God. And as we look, we'll see different areas where he says, look, I tried that, it did not work. And really, here's the things that we need to invest our time and energies into. One of the guiding themes that we've been looking at and will continue to look at across this series is this idea that a meaningful life is not measured by what we get, but rather by what we give, how we invest our lives, how we spend our days. Today, as we jump into the scriptures, we're going to look at what Solomon has to say about toil, about toil, something I think all of us deal with. So let's do this. Let's pray, and we'll jump in tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and I thank you that you lead and guide us along this journey, but I thank you you don't leave us where we are. But you constantly call us to a deeper place of understanding, of connection with you. Lord, I pray tonight as we look to the scriptures that you would speak to each and every one of us. That as we look to what your word has to say and what you said through Solomon more than a thousand years before Christ came, that something in our hearts and our souls would come alive tonight as you call us to continue the missional life that you invite us into. Speak to us, we pray. Guide us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Have you ever worked on something incredibly hard? Have you ever spent hours and hours investing time and energy into something that in all reality did not play out the way you thought it would in your mind? If you have attended any kind of university, you know what it's like to pour hours of your life into research and into study to then write a paper that you know your professor will enjoy and then you get to the day before it's due, and at 3 a.m., as you're finishing the last of your brilliant sentences, because all brilliant sentences come at 3 a.m., you begin to finish that sentence, and all of a sudden your computer goes, Poof. It's in that moment you realize you didn't really want the degree anyway, right? For moments when something that you're hoping to engage in doesn't turn out the way you thought. When I was a kid, I wanted to please my mom. And I thought, look, here's what I'm going to do. On one of the days that I can celebrate her, I'm going to do something for her super special. I'm going to do something for her that she will enjoy and she'll know how much I love her. And so here's what I thought. I will do all of the things I can do and put together all of her favorite things in one place so she'll know that I know her and that I love her. And so I thought, well, she likes sandwiches. So I said, I'll make her a sandwich. And so I began, and I thought, you know what? She likes cheese, so I put cheese on it. And then I thought, well, she likes onions, so I put onion on it. And then I thought, well, she loves tomatoes, so I put tomato on it. And she never eats her tomatoes without salt, so I put copious amounts of salt on it. And then I started thinking, well, she likes peanut butter as well. Creme de cacahuete. So I put that on the sandwich. Pickles, chocolate. I just kept adding everything that I could think. Marshmallows. She loves them. They went on the sandwich. 
and I collected all the things I knew she loved because I knew she would know how much I loved her when I finished this project for her. And then I realized, well, she really loves hot sandwiches. And so I put copious amounts of butter on both sides of the bread, mayonnaise inside. Look, if you ever wondered if there's such a thing as too much butter, there is. I made all this together and then strategizing, talking with my sister, I realized that we should put this in the oven. And so she helped me turn it on. She's a couple years older. I was like six or seven and she was wise and mature beyond her years. Not really. And so we put it in the oven and then, have you ever gotten distracted in the middle of a project? You know what that's like, don't you? Start off with all the right intentions, but you get side railed and distracted. And so we put this masterpiece of everything that I knew she would enjoy and love in the oven. And I then forgot that I was in the middle of this project. I went off to do something else very important, probably had to do with football, soccer. And so I'm sitting there in the house, and all of a sudden, my mother gets nervous. She goes, what is that smell? And I said, oh, that's the smell of perfection and surprise. She goes, no, but why are there fumes in the house? Why is the living room getting smoky? I said, I'll go check. She, should say, she said, we should go check together. I said, no, that will ruin the surprise. She said, trust me, I think there's already more of a surprise than we expected. We run to the kitchen, and I didn't know this was possible, but the sandwich inside the oven was on fire. To which I thought, en flambe, you know what I'm saying? It's like one step even further. Fancy for you, mom. And she pulled it out. I remember the feeling when she put it in the sink and doused it with water. And the feeling when we took it and threw it in the trash. And I said, are you sure you don't want just one bite? She said, no, I'm good. I toiled and toiled. I worked and worked to try and come up with something that I thought would please her. Only to realize that it was all in that moment I felt like Solomon in vain. Meaningless, my project. As we look through the scriptures tonight, Solomon is going to show us how our toil, if we are not careful, is a meaningless endeavor. Toil, what does that mean? Let's look at it real quick before we really jump in. Toil is hard and continuous work, exhausting labor, laborious work, to labor arduously or to strive. So as we're looking at this word toil, it is the idea that we are working exhaustingly, that we are working on a regular basis, toiling and striving, doing and doing to try and get to some place where we can do something that means something. If we're honest with ourselves, we fall into a pattern in life as humanity where we think that by our doing, we will achieve value and significance and meaning in life, do we not? So often we wrap up our identity in what we toil for. And the reality is, is that as we are toiling, if we're not careful, it becomes our identity. And then in our efforts to please God, we put everything into our efforts to work and labor and do because we think in some way we'll please him or we'll prove to him that what we're doing is full of value and meaning. And here's the problem. If we tie up our identity in the things that we do, then we're missing the point of the meaningful life that God's inviting us into. I had a conversation with a friend of mine not long ago who was a dentist. And if you're honest, guys, what do we do, especially as men, right? We say to one another when we first meet, hey, my name's John, my name's so-and-so. The next thing out of our mouth, always, what do you do? Well, what do you do? And we find great value and meaning and identity in being able to say what we do. And so I asked my friend, this dentist, I said, so, like, who are you? And his response was typical. He said, I'm a dentist. And I said, okay, but what does that mean? He says, I am a dentist. And I said, well, what happens if you lose both your hands? Then what? He said, well, I guess I wouldn't be a dentist anymore. I said, well, at least not one that I go to, you know what I'm saying? And the problem is this. We find ourselves taking identity in the things we do instead of who God has made us to be. So as we look tonight, Solomon is going to unpack for us what this looks like. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 17 begins, and he says, so I hated life. Let's stop for just a minute, because Solomon, right before this, starts speaking to us where he says, look, I realized something very important about humanity and about life, and he says, here's what I realized. At the end of their lives, those who are incredibly wise, they die. And he says, and I realized at the end of their lives, those who live incredibly foolish lives, they die. And so he goes, so I realized, what's the point? At the end of it all, if you're wise, you die. And if you're foolish, you die. Translation, we all die. Bum, bum, bum. Like, 
Yay, it's an uplifting message. He's saying, look, we all die at the end of it all. At the end of our lives, we all face the same end. And so he comes to the point where he goes, which really upset me. So I hated life. You ever been there? He's like, what's the point? He says, because the work that is done under the sun was so grievous to me, and all of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. We know that phrase, under the sun, means in this life. And he says, and I hated all things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Now, if you know anything about Solomon and anything about the history of Israel, realistically, after Solomon's reign as king, the whole kingdom falls apart. And so here he's having this struggle, this interior battle where he's going, look, I'm looking at the guys who are coming next. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's not looking good. How true that was and how right he would be. Shortly after the rain turns over, the kingdom is ripped apart, and it takes a very, very long time before anything happens towards restoration. He continues and says, and who knows whether the person that comes after you will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my life and my effort, my skill in this life under the sun. And so this too is meaningless. He says, so my heart began to despair. Now he's on this spiral where he's realizing, oh no, where are we going with this thing? Over all the toilsome labor under the sun, for a person may labor with wisdom and knowledge and skill. He's saying, look, you can do everything right. And yet at the end of it all, they must leave all they own to another who has not toiled for it. And this too is meaningless and great misfortune. What is he saying? He's saying, look, realistically, if you put your focus and your confidence and the the hope for meaning and things that pass by he goes look you're gonna die and someone who doesn't deserve it who will not proctor it well who doesn't understand that it doesn't really bring meaning will step in and continue and it will not go well he says but what do people get for all the toil and anxious striving by which they labor under the sun i think that's a question that we all ask ourselves right in all of our toil in all our anxious labor have you ever been anxious as you labor in this life he's saying in all of the anxiety in all the stress in in everything that you're doing he says what does it really get you all their day's work is grief and pain and at night their minds still do not rest and this too is meaningless i love that solomon speaks straight to the heart of humanity thousands of years ago a thousand years before christ even came he knew exactly how every person feels when they're overwhelmed and stressed and working as hard as they can but wondering if it was going as well as they thought and and he's saying look i lay at night in my bed and my mind is racing wondering if i said the right thing if i did the right thing if i'm working the way that god wants me to if i'm investing my life and my energy in anything that actually matters along the way And how many times have you been there? How many times have you lied in bed at night wondering if you said the right thing, if you did the right thing, if what you were investing your time and energy, your efforts, your passions, your giftings into was really what God had in store for your life and what would bring meaning along the way. He continues and says, a person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. He's saying, look, if you actually are able to find meaning and happiness, joy through what you do, that your passions connect with who God made you to be, that's a beautiful thing. But then he reminds us, he says, but this too, I can see, is from the hand of God. He's saying, if we live a life that is full of meaning and enjoyment, it's a gift given to us from God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? And I love this next verse. In verse 26, he says, to the person who pleases him, God gives wisdom and knowledge and happiness. To the person that pleases God, he gives wisdom and knowledge and happiness. Now look, as we're looking at this idea of toil and breaking down what Solomon has to say to us, I want to look at three areas tonight that each of us as Christ followers should put into practice and really focus in on to be able to live the life of meaning that God is inviting us into. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, hey, John, I'm not a follower of Christ. I'll talk with you in a minute. The first thing tonight is this, that we should know God. I want you to write that down if you're taking notes. Know God. Many times we say, well, I know God. I I believe in Jesus. I follow him. The more we know God, the more we find our identity in him. 
I think if we're honest with ourselves, if we're not careful, we come to the place where we say, you know what, I'm going to put my trust in Jesus. I'm going to put my trust in God. But the question I have is, do you really know him? Is it something that is superficial or is it a relationship that you're building on year after year after year? I'll be honest with you, I didn't just meet my wife and in one day come to the place where we thought we should get married because you're cute and I am able to carry heavy things. <laughs> no, we built a relationship. We got to know each other through the basis of friendship and relationship and growing together. We came to the place where we said, you know what, I want to do life with you because I know you and I want to make this journey together. In the same way, sometimes we come to the place where we go, I've accepted Jesus. I've asked him into my heart. I've made the decision to say yes to faith. But if we're not careful, we don't go deeper in our relationship with him. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, there's a scripture that speaks to this very idea. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Jesus speaking, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? I love that they're breaking this down for him. They're saying, look at all the things I did for you. Look at all the things that I did in your name. Look at all the things that I did over and over, toiling and working and striving and I put your name on it to honor you. I made you a sandwich. <laughs> and Jesus, it says, looks at them, and he tells them plainly, I never knew you. I think it's interesting that in this scripture, he doesn't say, no, you didn't do those things. He doesn't say, no, you didn't spend energy and time doing everything you thought I wanted you to do. What he said was, I never knew you. See, so often what we do is this, we find identity in the things that we do, and then we try and attach his name to them so that we can try and find meaning through what we're doing. And what he's saying is this, I want to know you. I want to build a relationship with you. I want to be, come to the place where you know my voice, where you understand what it means to hear from me, where you do what you do because it's an outflow of the relationship we have with Christ being central in your life. The reality is, is so often we want to put ourselves in the center of our own lives. We're the protagonist. We're the main character. We're the person that is doing this life. And so we put ourselves in the center. And when we do, we cannot quench the appetite that self will have in that moment. And really, if we're going to know him, it means making that move to where we say, I will not be central. Christ will be central. That's one of our core values here at the church. Christ-centered. Because if we live a life where Christ is central in our lives, you know, he takes first place and priority in our journey, then what happens is the more we know him, the more we recognize his voice, the more what we do reflects his heart. The more what we do reflects his will and his way, and it changes the way we do life. It changes how we live. And here he's saying, do you know me? I love Psalm 46 verse 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I'm God. Can I be honest with you? I hate to be still. I hate it. My <laughs> brain's like, that's true. I hate being still. Nothing about me wants to be still, ever. People say, when do you slow down? I say, I sleep at night for a few hours here or there. I've never been one of those people that likes alone time. How many of you like alone time? I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you deliverance you know <laughs> I've always been the person that didn't want alone time I'm an extrovert in every sense of the word I love being with people I love hearing your stories I love hanging out together when I'm tired let's just talk a little bit longer because soon the night will be over and we won't be able to chat anymore and then we'll do it again tomorrow morning and for the longest time I had this posture of I don't want alone time because that'll just be boring me myself and I let's find someone to hang out with Let's put on some music. Let's watch a movie. Let's do something. And being still was not something I would describe as anything I would ever look for in life. Until a few years ago, I realized that I was not being still the way that the scripture was inviting us to be still. And he says, be still and know that I'm God. And so in a very Solomon type way, I thought maybe if I begin carving out some time in my day, 
I'll be able to put this into practice. And I started with like 15 seconds. I was like, wow, that was long, you know. <laughs> but the more and more that I spent time being still, the more I began to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit. I think it's important that today on what church history calls the day of Pentecost, that we would say that we should make this an effort to be still and know who he is. The Holy Spirit was offered by Jesus. He said, look, when I go away, I'm going to send to you the comforter that will help you and direct you along the way. And so often, if we're honest with ourselves, we are so busy going and doing and toiling and striving that we don't really even recognize his voice. And so I want to admonish you. I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you tonight to be still and know that he is God, to really know him, to begin recognizing his voice. And so I want to do this. I want to challenge you. Maybe you say, John, I already do this for long periods of time. God bless you. You preach next week. But I want to encourage you this week to wake up 10 minutes before you normally do. Some of you, that's 5.45 in the morning. Some of you, that's like 11.50. Shame on you. I want you to wake up 10 minutes before you normally do, and I don't want you praying. I don't want you reading. I don't want you to listen to excellent worship music that moves your soul or anything else. I want you to sit in silence, to be still, and to wait on the voice of the Holy Spirit. Someone today asked me after our 10 a.m., they said, wait, John, when you did this, you heard God's voice? I was like, not for a while. First couple times I did it, I was like, okay. I took a 10-minute nap. Shame on me. But over time, being still and offering space, I began to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. I began to recognize what his voice sounded like. I began to understand when he was leading me to do certain things, to step into certain situations. And as we're looking at what it means to live a life of meaning, you have to know him. Not just toil for him. Not just do things to fill your day. You have to know who he is. And so I want to encourage you, be still and hear his voice. The second thing tonight is this, rely on God. Rely on God. Know him and rely on God. There are many scriptures where he says, come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. But we need to rely on God. If we're honest with ourselves, here's the truth. We rely on so many more things before we turn to God. If we're honest with ourselves, we rely on our own abilities. We rely on our own strengths. We rely on our own giftings and passions and ways of looking at the world. We rely on life experience, what situations have taught us. We rely on our friends and our family. Brandy relies on me to carry heavy things and to move stuff around the house. I rely on her for everything. We rely on those who are close to us. And then when those things don't turn out the way that we hope or go like we want them to go, we then come back to God and we go, oops, could you help? Now I want to rely on you. We have to rely on God in a real and practical way. So I want to ask this question. What have you been relying on? What have you been relying on? Where have you been turning for the help that you need to make it through your journey. If it's on anything that is temporal, passing, fleeting, Solomon would echo these words through the Holy Spirit, it is meaningless. Don't allow yourself to fall into that rut of turning to somewhere else. Rely on God. True satisfaction comes to us through God. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25, a person can do nothing better than eat and drink and find satisfaction in their toil, but this is from the hand of God and him alone. The person who pleases him will find wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. The third thing tonight is this, stay on mission. Stay on mission. What does that mean? At the beginning of every year, Brandy and I spend time together praying and talking and seeking God for direction for that year. It's just something we started doing in our marriage, and if you don't do it, I would recommend it. And every year, God's been so good to give us a word or a phrase or something that has kind of been interwoven through our conversation and our decisions throughout that year. And this year, as we were praying and seeking God for guidance, what we felt like he dropped in our hearts was this, stay on mission. We are missional people. We are people who are called the same way that Jesus has always called those who have put their confidence in him to come and to follow him, to live a missional life with him directing. 
But so often we are too concerned about what we will do and we forget to ask God who is wanting us to become. So often we are too concerned about what we will do and we forget to ask God who he is wanting us to become. I think this is one of the great questions that we forget to ask in life. I hear people all the time talking about where they should live, what they should do, what they should pursue, what hobbies or passions God's given them, what careers he's asking them to step into, but they never ask this question, who has he called you to be? Who has he called you to be? Because out of understanding who he has called you and created you to be should come the outflow of what he's called you to do and where he's called you to live. If you can answer this question, if we can answer this question as followers of God, it will change everything about how we do life. Who has he called you to be? Who has he designed you to become? Why has he placed you where you are? In the job, in the city, in the family, in the relationship, in the, in the conversations that he puts you on a regular basis. Who are you supposed to be? And if you can begin to understand that, you begin to understand why you are doing the things you are doing and why you toil. It's because of who he's called you to be and the outflow and expression of where you live and what you do and what you say and who you are becomes this beautiful connection between the heart of God who is central in your life and the giftings and passions and who he's created you to become. And the outflow of that brings honor and glory to his name and to his kingdom. God is here and everything we do should emanate from our relationship with him. Stay on mission. Have you gotten sidetracked? Is your life on mission? Where have you been striving and toiling, trying to make it work? People would invite those of us that have put our confidence and our hope in him to understand that the toil, the way our humanity will do it, brings no meaning. But as we know him, as we recognize his voice, as we rely on him completely and truly, and as we stay on mission, he invites us to live life in a way that is meaningful, impactful, and full of purpose. The life of meaning is not measured by what we can get, but by what we give and how we live the missional life he calls us to. Close your eyes. I want to spend a few moments in prayer and reflection. But before we go to a time of prayer and reflection on what we've talked about tonight, and I want to encourage you, when we go into this time of prayer and reflection, and really from here on out, I want you to open your heart and open your soul to the Holy Spirit. Allow Him to shine a spotlight into your life. Allow Him to speak to you. Before we go into that time, we always want to be aware to ask this question. And maybe you're here tonight and you would say, John, I am not a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never placed your trust in him. You've never asked him to forgive you of your sins or of the past. You've never asked him to lead you and guide you in a new way of living full of purpose and meaning, peace and life. But maybe you're here tonight and you would say, John, you know what? I want to ask Jesus into my heart. If that's you, I want to pray with you. Or maybe you're here tonight and you'd be honest enough to say, John, you know what? I used to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe some people still think that I am. But it's been a really long time since I actually lived for him. And maybe you're here tonight and you would say, I could really use a fresh start right where you are I'm going to call you out I just want to pray with you if you're here tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed and you say John I want to ask Jesus into my heart or John I need a fresh start tonight would you just raise your hand so I can pray with you where you are yeah I see you I see you yeah I need a fresh start John I need Jesus in my heart. I need a new beginning. If that's you, just throw your hand up right back down. Yeah, I see you. Yeah, okay. I need a fresh start. Yeah, okay. Let's do this to support our friends that raise their hands. Let's pray this prayer together tonight. Lord Jesus, I need you. 
Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of the past. Come into my heart. I accept you as the Son of God. Give me a fresh start. Give me hope and a bright future. Life here and eternal. And the Bible says if we ask him to come in, that he does, that he gives us a fresh start. He says the old has gone and the new has come, and we are new creations in Christ Jesus. So if you raised your hand, if you prayed that tonight, congratulations. At the end of the gathering, we have a next step table in the back. We have our prayer team will be on the front and sides, and you can go ahead and move now. If you'd like prayer, they'd be happy to pray with you. If you need a Bible or some info on how to go deeper in this walk that you started tonight, go to the next step table, and we'd be happy to help you on this journey that you've begun. But congratulations. Welcome home. Now for the next few moments right where you are, I want you to spend just a couple of minutes in prayer and reflection just between you and Jesus. And I want you to ask yourself these questions. Where in my life have I been toiling in my own strength? And how is God asking me to rely on Him. Let's take a moment in prayer, and I'll come back and close.